you know, when players play major junior hockey and then go to university, usually when they become student athletes, it's sort of the end of the road for the NHL dream. Not necessarily so for our guest this week. Paul McFarland is from the class of 2010 and carved out a career in the National Hockey League, but not on the ice. It was behind the bench, and Paul joins us right now. Paul, thanks for doing this. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great to be here. You know what? It's uh, There's so many things we're going to get a chance to talk about, uh, Paul, but uh, I think maybe for a little bit of uh, history, you're from Richmond Hill, Ontario, and you played in the Ontario Hockey League. How did Acadia get on your radar and you end up in Wolfville? Well, I've told this story a few times. Uh, I think uh, I was playing major junior hockey in Windsor for the Spitfires uh, as a 20-year-old, and uh, Darren uh, Burns came up to see me uh, probably in, I think, late November, early December, took me out for lunch. Uh, I don't think it was a, a well-known spot in the Windsor area by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, obviously sold me pretty well on uh, the program of Acadia, and that started to get the ball rolling um, to later come down on a recruiting trip uh, at the end of that season. So uh, that's, that's really what started the focal point for Acadia for me. You played four years. You were a captain. You were very involved. In, uh, in the community. Just talk about your four-year experience and when you reflect on that time at Acadia, you know, what surfaces for you? Yeah, I still look back as one of the best decisions I've ever made and uh, I think uh, that when I came out originally on the recruiting trip, I was there about a day and realized uh, how much I uh, love Wilfil and I thought that was really going to be the ultimate ex experience for me where you get the best of uh, all three worlds, really, where you get uh, academics, uh, athletics, and then the, the opportunity to be involved uh, and, and be a part of a, a great community that is really like no other place that I've been, uh, even to this day. So um, I think uh, for myself, I just thought it was important to be involved in all three of those aspects. And uh, I really think uh, my experience working with um, kids, whether it be through schools or obviously the Acadia Hockey Schools, uh, really started the passion for me in uh, coaching. And uh, I think after leaving uh, Acadia and uh, entering the business world for a, sh a short period, uh, you know, realized how much uh, influence Acadia did have on, on that. And obviously that's where uh, my career has traveled since then. Paul, you epitomize, you know, sort of the, the player that Darren Burns would recruit to Acadia you know, a leader that's going to be a leader on and off the ice might not necessarily be the guy that's going to score 30 goals in a season, but it's going to be the guy that's going to leave it on the ice. You know, when you came to Acadia, did you see yourself in that leadership role and and, and, did, and how much did you embrace it as, as a university player? Yeah, I think that was a huge part of my Acadia experience. You know, Darren uh, named me captain in my second year. Uh, allowing me to finish the last three years as the captain. I think that was just great experience uh, being put into that uh, sort of role and spotlight. Um, it's my belief that, you know, leadership is a skill that's developed. And obviously the only one of the ways to, to do that is by having that experience and going through the ups and downs of being in those types of positions. And uh, I'm really grateful that I had that opportunity at Acadia and was able to um, gain a lot of experience that's helped me as a coach and, uh, uh, you mentioned me being not being a 30-goal scorer. That's why you coach at 25 years old, I guess. But uh, that's somehow things work out. You know what? You know, oftentimes in athletics, you know, the pillars at Acadia are, are, are athletic, uh, you know, competition. There's the academic, and then there's community. You've checked all the boxes. And, you know, you think about your time volunteering in Acadia minor hockey or for Smile. You're a three-time academic All-Canadian. And, of course, we just talked about what you did on the ice. So, you know, from that community aspect, it's so important, especially in a, in a small school like Acadia University in a small community. Was that something you grew up, like, were you a community guy or was that something when you arrived at Acadia, all of a sudden it falls in your lap? Well, I think it started um, uh, actually in playing major junior, to be honest, uh, playing in Kitchener my first two and a half years in the OHL. Uh, it was almost an expectation playing in Kitchener that you were going to be involved in the community. And obviously that, that had an initial impact on me. And then just being a part of Acadia Athletics and, and that community, I think you're uh, right away thrown into um, or, or around a lot of great people and great kids for that matter. And uh, um, you started to take pride in uh, obviously helping them develop, you know, through hockey schools or the SMILE program. Um, but all, it's more importantly, you're helping people. And I think hopefully having an impact on, on their lives and, um, that was a big selling point for, you know, coming to Acadia. I think just the impact that you do get to have on the community 
uh, as well as um, you know just the smaller smaller class sizes. Uh, that was a huge influence on, on my decision and, and again building relationships with professors and, and the people in your classes uh, unlike I, I think any other university that you can go to. So 2020, 2010 rolls around, you walk across the stage, you get your diploma and Paul McFarland's off for probably a career in business and it starts out that way but it doesn't last very long. Talk a little bit about the road from leaving Acadia working away from hockey and then getting back into it? Yeah, when I left Acadia, I worked uh, almost a full year uh, with a CA firm, uh, which is obviously what I went to school in accounting and business at Acadia. And so uh, really just, just thought that was how things were going to play out. Uh, and then, like I said, probably around that time, I realized that my passion was in, in teaching and uh, also coaching for that matter. So I went back to school to go to teacher's college and uh, fortunately, um, you know, got a call at, at, as I was finishing teacher's college to get involved in coaching. Uh, DJ Smith called me, who was working at the time for the Windsor Spitfires, just hired as a uh, head coach with the Oshawa Generals. Uh, he actually coached me while I played in Windsor. So it's, it's funny how those relationships work in the game of hockey. Uh, and he kind of gave me my first start uh, as an assistant coach in the Ontario Hockey League. You know, playing through major junior and through university, like, would that even have been something you said, I'd love to do that? Or was it even, was it on your radar? I think I've always had a passion for teaching and, and working with kids. And I think the impact you get to have, not just, you know, on the ice, but also working with people. So I think it's probably always been something that's been within me, um, but never probably thought it was going to be the career path until uh, really my time at Acadia, where I realized how much I love the game and, and the teaching aspects of it. And, I think once you uh, don't maybe have it every day, you realize how much you miss it and how uh, you know important it is to get back uh, involved. And um, never did I think it was going to come along this, this quickly, obviously, but I've been very fortunate to work with some great people that have uh, helped me along the way. So you're an assistant coach in Oshawa for two years and great opportunity to be a head coach with Kingston, uh, you know, a, a, a program that's been around for a, a long, long time. And you're the youngest CHL coach in the country. Uh, so talk about transitioning as an assistant coach and your role as a head coach with, you know, basically 16, 17, 18 year olds. Yeah, those uh, first three years as a head coach, I grew a lot. And uh, I think uh, when you're an assistant coach, you always uh, have ideas in the back of your mind of what you would do and you, if, if and when you get that opportunity to be a head coach. But until you're actually in the chair and the one that uh, is in that role, I think uh, you really don't really actually gain that experience until you have it. So I uh, really thought, uh, you know, both through my time in Kingston and working with Hockey Canada for those three years, uh, I grew a lot as a coach and um, it was a great experience, a uh, stepping stone for my coaching career. And then, of course, you wrap things up in Kingston because you get an opportunity that everybody would want, and that's to be, uh, as you guys say in hockey, in the show. And uh, you end up with the Florida Panthers as an assistant coach for two years. How did that come about, Paul? Well, uh, it's like a lot, a lot of things in, in the hockey world. I think uh, everything is done through um, networking and the people you meet and hopefully the impact you can have. And, uh, you know, Bob Boogner was given the job with the Florida Panthers as the head coach. Uh, him and DJ Smith are very close, uh, worked together uh, with the Spitfires. Um, so he gave me an opportunity to interview for the job. And uh, for, obviously it went uh, as well as it could have and um, was offered a job after that interview process. It all kind of happened uh, pretty quickly. And to be honest, going into that interview, I wasn't really you know, thinking I was gonna get the job. It was more so just to gain that experience and uh, going through that type of a process. Um, but I uh, was obviously thrilled to have the opportunity to get the chance to, to coach at the National Hockey League, to coach you know, with the best players in the world and uh, you know, really gain that experience that I didn't have as a player. Paul, when you, uh, when you go to Florida to be a coach, just talk about the transition. So now you're leaving Kingston where you're, you know, you're coaching kids that are in their late teens, mid to late teens. Now you're with guys that might have families at home. Obviously, there's some young players in the NHL. What's that transition like? Well, the biggest transition, I think, is, A, it's, it's um, the player's livelihood. Uh, ultimately, that's uh, not that, you know, young kids don't want to be want it to be their livelihood but uh, guys do have uh, like you said families and, and children for that matter and uh, they're at that stage dedicating their entire life to you know playing the game of hockey so 
uh, that care factor uh, and managing um, the ups and downs or trying to help them manage those ups and downs uh, throughout the season can be difficult. And obviously there's a lot more outside pressure at the National Hockey League level than there would be in running a, you know, a junior hockey program for that matter. Um, so I think there's a few things that go with that, but uh, ultimately uh, um, because of that, you know, they're, they're grown men and uh, they take a lot of pride in what they do and how they work and how they show up to the rink every day. So it's just great to see um, the attention to detail and the effort uh, that they put forth just to, uh, in a lot of ways, get their body uh, and mind ready to play. So you don't play at the NHL level. You're a young coach coming into the NHL for the first time. How intimidating is it for you personally to be working with these guys, especially in the early going? Yeah, you know what? I think you just come in and you get to work. And it's like any other coaching job. Uh, X's and O's, everyone has their own ideas on, on what they believe as far as that goes. But ultimately, it comes down to you know building relationships and uh, showing the players that you care about them and want to help them get better. And I think uh, any time a player sees that from a coach, uh, they're going to be willing to listen. And uh, I think uh, in a lot of ways, as an assistant anyways, um, you're definitely having dialogue back and forth and a, lo a lot of small conversations throughout your day, um, trying to gauge how a player's feeling, uh, where their mind's at, and then obviously trying to help them get better on the ice. So uh, it's all a great experience to go through. And uh, the reality is, is, whether it's junior hockey or the NHL, uh, I mean, on any team, you're going to have multiple personalities and uh, you have to relate to different players in different ways. So it's just trying to find your way, um, you know, with learning about those players and how you best can uh, complement them as a coach. In the NHL circles, you earned a great reputation as, as being an up-and-comer in terms of you know, power play. You oversaw the power play in Florida, and it was one of the best in the NHL during your time there. You know, so where did that focus come from for you on 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 the power play for a hockey team? Well, I think as an assistant in the NHL, you've got to be uh, – that has to be a strength of yours, either on the power play or the penalty kill. On most staffs, they would be asked to um, run one of those special teams units, and uh, obviously the head coach still – uh, gets to have their opinion and say in, in those areas. But I think ultimately uh, you take a lot of pride in um, how those units are run. And uh, being that your you know, number one, I, I guess, priority as far as coaching goes, with the exception of helping the players in those relationships, uh, you spend a lot of time watching power plays, um, watching penalty kills of, of the opposition, uh, really learning the finer details of it. And I think that's uh, another thing that hopefully has made me a lot better coach, just really zoning in on that one area of the game. And uh, we did have some success in both Florida and Toronto, but uh, ultimately the players are the ones that are on the ice and they deserve uh, all the credit because they're the one that they have to go out and execute. And there's the segue for us because you mentioned Toronto. There's a coaching change in Florida. So now you're out, but you're in very quickly and you end up uh, in with the Toronto Maple Leafs uh, about a year ago. Talk about how that comes about. Yeah, I was very fortunate. Uh, obviously, uh, being fired for the first time uh, in Florida, uh, I think, is a unique, hopefully, a unique experience to go through, uh, where um, you're not sure what the next uh, job's going to be. Uh, and uh, fortunately, I had Mike uh, Babcock call me uh, pretty quickly after getting let go by Florida, um, and you know, going through the obviously the hiring process there, uh, talking with Kyle Dubas. Um, uh, quickly, I was able to land uh, a next job in Toronto. So uh, I was pretty fortunate just based on, I think, some of the uh, success uh, for the things I was responsible for that we had in Florida uh, that quickly led to another opportunity, obviously, in Toronto. A lot different in the city of Toronto uh, being behind the bench with the Maple Leafs than it is with the Panthers in Florida. Just what was that transition like for you? Yeah, to be honest, I, I, I obviously it is a different market and, and uh, the media and the focus that the Leafs get compared to uh, most teams in the NHL for that matter is very different, uh, you know, as far as even looking up in practice and you see, you know, anywhere from, you know, 50 to 70 media outlets that are overhanging to watch uh, a day-to-day -day practice. Uh, it's definitely an, a change, but I think uh, ultimately – once the job starts, it's really the same, whether you're coaching in, in Kingston or Florida, Toronto, I think you just get so ingrained in the day-to-day -day process of the job. And, um, you know, constantly as a coach, you're trying to figure out ways that uh, you can either help a player get better or, um, you know, evaluate how the team can get better um, in certain areas of the game. So I think really you start to just get invested in that and uh, hopefully over time you're able to make some progress.
Well, I think ultimately it was just a chance to grow and uh, I loved my time both in Florida and with the Maple Leafs. Uh, it was an unbelievable experience to get a chance to coach at the National Hockey League level, uh, being an assistant coach. But um, in order to be a head coach, I think you need to have that experience of, uh, like I said, sitting in that chair and, and gaining the opportunity of uh, making those uh, difficult decisions and uh, being held, I guess, accountable for, for those decisions. Um, so ultimately just to grow as a coach, as a young guy still, I just thought it was the right time uh, for myself and my family for that matter to make the move back and, you know, coming back to a, obviously a city that I know very well, having already been here once, it made the uh, transition uh, very easy. First year with Kingston, the Frontenacs, not only you're the head coach, you're also the general manager. So it comes with a, a lot more on your plate. And uh, at this time of the year, you know, you typically be gearing up to start the season. And with the pandemic, obviously, uh, you know, uh, in the Ontario Hockey League, that's delayed till December. But just talk about that whole transition, your roles and responsibilities from where you've been the last three years. Yeah, it's transitioned uh, pretty quickly. I think I went from the bubble uh, right into the seat at the rink in, uh, in the Leon Center in Kingston, but uh, everything's been great. Obviously, the staff and people are, have been outstanding and helping me get uh, climatized back into Kingston. And unfortunately, my, uh, my wife, Kelly, and kids have done a great job of uh, pretty much moving our home from Toronto to, to Kingston as well uh, while I was in the bubble. So uh, everything from that standpoint has been pretty easy. Uh, as far as the job goes, uh, you know, on, on the coaching side now, it's really just trying to dig into learning more about our players that are coming back and understanding their tendencies, strengths, areas where uh, maybe we can help them more to develop. And then obviously on the management side, it's uh, going to be a learning curve on some of the areas, uh, more on the administrative side. Uh, so we're spending a little bit of time trying to do that, but also uh, really just familiarize, familiarizing myself with the league. And uh, being out of the league three years, you almost miss a whole cycle of players at junior hockey. So uh, learning each team as far as their individual players um, and then also uh, how their team plays, the structure pieces that are involved in each team. That's kind of where we're spending a lot of our time uh, to get organized. Paul, you mentioned about being in the NHL bubble. So I'm just going to jump back to it for a second. So the NHL has certainly been applauded for how, you know, it's been able to take Edmonton and Toronto transition all of these teams and and so far knock on wood um you know it's been virus free and what have you but when you look back at going into that bubble was there one or two things that surfaced you where we never expected this because on the surface everything looks great but you guys are on the inside is what do you what do you recall from going in that maybe it was a surprise I don't think there was really any surprises. I think we were so well prepared, to be honest, of, of what to expect. And um, the NHL did an incredible job as far as uh, logistically organizing, uh, you know, our, our travel to and from the rinks. And obviously uh, being with the Maple Leafs, uh, everything's done first class uh, all year round uh, from their perspective anyways. So uh, really uh, just kind of felt like you're on a ro on the road trip. Obviously, you weren't able to really go anywhere other than um, some you know, certain restaurants and uh, to and for to and from your, I guess, hotel room and the coaches, coaches meeting room. But uh, really, it just felt like uh, any other kind of road extended road trip, to be honest with you, where uh, uh, obviously we weren't in there, you know, that long. So it would have been nicer to maybe be in there a little longer. But I think ultimately, uh, the time that we were in there was uh, very well done by the NHL. When you left Wolfville in 2010, and I looked at you and said, Paul, 10 years from now, you'll have three years under your belt in the NHL as a coach, what would you have said to me? Yeah, I probably would have said you're crazy. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's funny how things work. And uh, I don't really, I'm just not a person that really sets, I mean, yes, you have long-term goals. I think everyone does obviously uh, have, have those things, but I really just try to stay uh, in, within the moment as much as possible. And uh, when I was at Acadia, I really tried to enjoy and, and soak up all that Acadia has to offer. Um, in all three areas we've already talked about today. And uh, it was a tough day, I think, in 2010 to, to leave it, to be honest with you. Uh, uh, it was almost culture shock uh, being outside the Wilfville bubble, uh, if you want to call it that, uh, after being there for four years. But uh, I think just trying to stay in the moment and really focus on ways to get better each and every day and constantly learning uh, from experience. Uh, it's tried to obviously help me over the last 10 years, but I still got a long way to go. Yeah, I'm excited and uh, I guess uh, honored that, uh, you know, Doug Springer, owner here, has given me the opportunity of, of both uh, both roles. And I think uh, with it comes a great challenge. And 
Uh, obviously a lot of work that I'm not going to be able to do by myself. Uh, I'm going to need um, some people around me that are going to be able to help me in, in all regards, no different than as being a head coach. Your uh, assistants are a huge part of uh, any head coach's success. So uh, I think uh, myself, it's a, it's a great challenge and it's probably going to be different from obviously the last time I was here, but organizing, you know, from scouting to recruiting to our development plan, uh, and trying to, I guess, build it all, you know, with one common goal and how it all works together is exciting for me. But ultimately, uh, coaching is still uh, my passion. And uh, I think for the reason of just being as close as you can uh, to, to the to playing the game, in my opinion. I think playing the game is obviously the best uh, when you're out there and you're on the ice and you're, you're actually playing, you know, the shifts itself. But coaching for me is the next best thing. And uh, you're right in the action. You feel the... Uh, the highs and the lows of a, of a season, of a game for that matter, uh, and obviously just the impact you get to have on, on the players. And uh, uh, that's one of the things that's, you know, for me, that's great about junior hockey is the, the impact that you get to see when you bring a 16-year-old to Kingston and uh, you watch him leave at 19 or 20 years old and just to see his development, not just on the ice, but hopefully more importantly as people. Um, that was, that's really what's intriguing about coming back for me.